graduated, yeah, you didn't graduate in Mesa, you graduated in Mesa. I graduated in Mesa. It was Mesa? Right at the beginning, yeah. Were you one of our first graduates? Um, in 2004. I, I, it took were. me a while to graduate, so I didn't know if I was first or not. Yeah, you were. That puts you right up at the top. And he made himself famous by volunteering for everything. So if you want to know how to really meet some cool people, follow his example. And anytime we ask for volunteers, volunteer. And you became really in with some of the, some well-known scholars in the, on the East Coast who still remember you and ask about you. Uh, but after he left BYU, he found his way into the Foreign Service, um, put his Russian to good use in the Ukraine with a tour there, and then went to the Jerusalem Consulate for a tour. Mm -hmm. And then turned up on my doorstep as an MBA student at BYU. And so I think he's got a lot to, to explain to us. <laughs> you know, why go into the Foreign Service? Um, why think about business school? How flexible are these careers? Can you move from one to another? Um, what good is an MBA in the Foreign Service? And if all else fails, he'll tell you great, great stories about the Jerusalem Council. So, I'm just over here. Also, okay, thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I'm not sure which. You may want to have all these guys introduce themselves. Cause they're, but there's not many that's great. Yeah. I know. They're, they're good and they're smart. So. Um, why don't we do that real quick? Just tell me your name, maybe where you're at, like you're a senior, first year in the program, and anything else that you think is, is worth knowing. We should start over here. I'm John Phelps. I actually met you once before at the Jerusalem Center. Yeah. Cool. Um, were, you, were you studying at the Jerusalem Center? Yeah, I was a senior there. Okay, so. awesome. um, yeah, I'm just a junior in international relations. So. Glad you're here. Yeah. Are you studying Arabic? As I, I did my freshman year, but on a mission came back, and I don't know about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you were there. You smartened up. <laughs> David, right? Yeah, I'm David. So I'm uh, David Romney. Uh, I'm in the second semester of Arabic now, and I'm a Mason major. Uh, um, so. You know what other information? You served in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, I served in Malaysia. And uh, um, yeah, I really am loving the major. I already talked to you a little bit yeah, about it. So I'm cool. trying to decide about it. Do you know what you want to do job wise or do I need to? Do you, and you can mention that too if you have any particular preferences or ideas. I'm not completely certain yet. I'm thinking about the foreign service. That's part of why I'm here. But um, not, not set yet. And Joe, do you have any job direction you're looking at? Or One third of the first yeah. Okay. You're next for us? Uh, I'm Alex Simmons. I transferred to BYU about a year ago and got into the Mesa program. I started studying here in Seattle. And Is it in Seattle? Yeah, I'm from Seattle. Oh, cool. so, uh, I'm born in so San Francisco. Okay, cool. Uh, but I have no idea what I, why I'm studying here. It's <laughs> after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going with it, I guess. Okay, thanks. That's cool. Uh, I transferred here two years ago. I'm a senior, this is my last semester, a Mesa student, and I'm also minoring in management, which is just the fancy way of the business school not giving business minors. Mm -hmm. So that's, so that's it with the Marriott School? Yeah. It's okay. So Mesa, uh, major, uh, do you know what you're going to do with that? Oh, I'm interested in international business, which is why I'm here, to kind of see Pick your brain. Oh, yeah, I, on, I, so. I've learned a little bit. I still don't know, you know so, exactly what I'm going to do. But yeah, yeah. I should chat. That's good. Thanks. All right, I'm Hugh Hinkson. Um, I'm in the Mace program. We left me for Egypt. Cairo? Oh, Cairo. Cairo. Yeah. yeah. And my goal has always been a master's in, in business or international business. I'm shocked. I didn't know anybody when I was uh, in Mason major who wanted to go into business. So we've got two right here, right? <laughs> And why, why business? What? Uh, uh, I don't want to work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> so you're already one of the Thanks to you, right? Yeah. My name is Joe Nielsen. I am a senior in Middle East Studies Arabic, no transfers. Um, I uh, have wondered what to do with Mesa for three years, and I. I'm also going to get a minor in management, and I want to do, I 
I've looked at both foreign service and doing the MBA. So my this is right out of my alley. Okay. Well, do you do an MBA right after school or work no, for years? No, work. I think that's, that's, that's a good option. That's why I wanted to get the, the minor first, so that I might be, so that I can be like somewhat qualified for a manager. You have a good narrative. That's, everybody asks me, so why are you doing business? We're skeptical. So if you have a minor in business as undergrad, that would yeah. give you a good story. Of, you know, I have a long term history of business. That's interesting. That's a good strategy. My name's Adam Purcell. I'm going to be heading to Cameron this summer as well, so I'm in the Mesa program. Also, um, semi-decently kind of like um, ahead on the far into the economics program here as well. So I'm kind of thinking maybe considering double major, at least a minor in econ. Um, and so yeah, this is like the dilemma in my mind as well, because I'd like to do State Department, it sounds amazing, but I'd also like to do business. Um, thinking of going and getting an MBA. Focusing on like international management, international business, maybe like Thunderbird or something. Mm -hmm. So, cool. Yeah. Um, my name's Arturo. I'm a senior. I'll be working this semester. And, well, oh, I'm thinking about, I, I want to get a JD MBA, um, but for sure a piece of MBA. I, I, was, I, was, I was sure I would get a JD MBA too. Uh -huh. There's some people talking out of it, so. <laughs> We, we can talk about that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as to future plans, I'm not sure. I don't know if I do want to do business, but I know that maybe you can transfer into, you know, the government sector or, or a lot of other things. So that's why I kind of do it. Thanks. So uh, you're graduating this summer, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. How long have you guys been in Cairo? Is it summer? Um, like three months in Cairo, and then traveling. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. It's good to get kind of a feel of where you guys are coming from. I'll maybe just tell you a little bit about my background. Feel free to interrupt with questions, or if you disagree with anything I'm saying, I'd love to hear that as well, because things change very quickly. Uh, you know, they were talking about politics in the Middle East, or career paths, or I, I felt that way coming back to BYU after just being away for about four years. I felt like, wow, things have changed, and how I go about looking for a job, how you know, schools accept application, and these blogs, and all these different things. It surprised me how much even academia is fluid and adapting to to technology in the world. So it's, it's, I'd be interested to hear your perspectives if you disagree with me. Um, let's see, I grew up in Las Vegas and moved to Oregon. So I consider myself from the Southwest and, and uh, Northwest. I never would have gone overseas. Well, maybe I would have for a mission or something. But I thought I'd live in Las Vegas my whole life. So that move that kind of got me interested in moving around a little bit more. I uh, came to BYU. Um, studied physics and chemistry and stuff my first year as a freshman. I went to Russia for two years. And while there as a missionary, I met a lot of students from the Middle East. Some from Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria. They wanted kind of a, a more uh, respected degree than they could maybe get in their home country, but couldn't afford tuition in Western Europe or, or America. So they went to, they went to Russia, so they went to Eastern Europe. Um, became good friends with some of them. Felt like I had more in common with some of them than I did with some of the Russians that I met, you know, who a lot of them drank a lot and had a lifestyle that I thought was more different than mine in some way than a lot of these Muslim students. So uh, I came back here and studied Arabic and loved it. Um, while I was here, I think Dr. Bowen was referring to, there was a visit to um, a professor from, uh, let's see, I want to say New York University? Uh, yeah, he was he coming out. Yes, as a university, right? He was coming to visit BYU. And, they needed somebody to pick him up at the airport, I think. So I picked him up and drove him around Salt Lake, and it was a great experience for me. And later, uh, when I was back at East, I actually went and spent the night at his house during you know, a snowstorm and had a great time. He 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 just been back from a trip to Rome. And we shoveled all the all snow. Of Jesus. We shoveled his walk so and his neighbor. We had a fun time. So uh, both that experience, and I've kept in touch with him somewhat, and um, uh, that experience and others. I would just echo what Dr. Bowen said, that uh, when you ask, or when other people ask for somebody to do something, um, it's a great way to meet new people, to open doors, and just have fun and create memories. And for me, I think that's one of the most valuable thing about the Mason Major for me, going to Cairo, doing the Washington, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Washington Seminar Program. I did an internship. Let's see, so after I uh, kind of started studying Arabic, um, I took a I think it was political systems of the Middle East class with Dr. Bowen. She mentioned this Washington seminar program. I signed up and went back there to intern with the Kuwait Information Office. 
which was essentially the branch of the Kuwait Embassy that uh, tried to uh, influence American public and somewhat American policy as kind of the public diplomacy branch that they wanted to have in Washington to make sure if things ever blew up between Saddam Hussein and Kuwait again, or if Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait or something along those lines, they could marshal support for Kuwait and the United States. And I was there from January to April 2003, right before the invasion of Iraq. So it was a fascinating time to be there. I got to deal with everything from um, you know, Department of Defense inquiries about Kuwait to helping journalists get visas. To everybody who was going into Iraq was going through Kuwait. Turkey and none of the other countries bordering Iraq would let American troops and supplies through. So whether it was civilian journalists or military people, um, Kuwait was the place to be. So it was an interesting window to see Washington and the policy process leading up to uh, a war, as well as uh, a great way to see how um, different branches of government and business and journalists um, all work together, and, and academics as well, um, in, in this process. So I put a plug in for Washington seminar as well. And actually, on that note, I was, I was thinking about graduating early. I could have graduated a whole year early, but instead I, I did Washington seminar, I did the study abroad in, in Syria, I was in Damascus, and I spent a summer in Kuwait and Bahrain. When I was interning in, in Kuwait, I wanted to go to Syria to study, but it was right in April, and the war broke out, I think, in, in March. So at that time, there was still some talk of perhaps the conflict spilling over into Syria. So I, I kind of uh, decided to postpone those plans. One of my coworkers in Kuwait, sorry, I, when I don't start talking, I'll just keep going. But I, I'm trying to get across the point that um, that once, once you get one door open, it can lead to many others. Doing internships, doing study abroads, volunteering, definitely take that route. One of my coworkers in, in Kuwait said, oh, my husband's the Minister of Education. Why don't you come to Kuwait for the summer? You can work at our, our office there in the Ministry of Information. You can live for free at the dorms, get three meals a day, and take some Arabic classes there. So I went, I paid for my airfare, and got a rental car for like 200 bucks, 250 bucks, 250 bucks a month and everything else was pretty much paid for. I had a great experience there in Kuwait. Another of my, my coworkers in, uh, in Washington said, hey, I know this guy, he's 80 years old, he works for the Middle East Policy Council, and he is traveling to Bahrain, if he'd like to have somebody there to help him take notes, and carry luggage around, and that kind of stuff, he'll pay for your airfare, and for your board, and food in Bahrain, if you'll help him out for a few weeks. So I went to Bahrain for a month, and had a great experience there, um, doing some academic research as well, for. Uh, Professor Emmett, who's uh, a geography professor here. So um, that internship in Kuwait opened the door. I'm sorry, that internship in DC opened the door to a lot of travel that I wouldn't have been able to afford or wouldn't have had the connections to arrange um, if I hadn't uh, done that internship. And then the semester in Syria, of course, was fantastic. And, and that all, I never would have gotten a job with the State Department if I hadn't had that experience. I could have had a 4.0, I didn't have a 4.0. But if, even if I had a 4.0 GPA, and if I had uh, you know some lots of club involvement, extracurricular activities, I don't believe I would have gotten my job in the State Department if I didn't have some experience. So I think most students lack. They have you know on the resume you've got experience section, education section. Usually we kind of fill out that education section, and the experience might be more from high school or summer jobs. If you can get something a little more substantial in the, in the experience section, the open doors. They really focused in, in the interview for the Foreign Service not as much as I thought on my background, is why my experience fit the position I applied for as a public diplomacy officer. So for these, those of you interested in the Foreign Service, I would look at that. Which track are you interested in? We could talk about that at another time, maybe, or today if you want. Uh, political, economic, uh, management, consular, or public diplomacy. What are you interested in? And then start looking for internships and opportunities now you can get experience in that specific cone because that's, that's one of the things that will, that will help get your foot in the door with the Foreign Service. So then I got my foot in the door with the Foreign Service. Um, I got married in between. I sent me to Kiev for two years where I was a management officer, managing contracting for the embassy, some HR functions, and uh, some operations with, with other agencies and departments. There are 14 agencies at the US Embassy in Kiev. So that was a great experience in some of the management things that I had no experience with as an undergrad. It was very valuable and it got me thinking about an MBA. Uh, and then in Jerusalem, it was a job I was, to be honest, dreading a little bit. It was consular work. Everyone in the State Department says consular work is uh, grunt work. You sit and do interviews all day long and uh, you get pretty tired and pretty worn out pretty quick. 
from, from some people I've spoken with, that was their experience, but it, it exceeded my expectations a million times over. It was fantastic. Uh, I was speaking Arabic, working with Palestinians. I also got to use my Russian a lot with Israelis. I was the fraud prevention manager, so I oversaw fraud investigations and just have lots of fun stories. Everything from going to Jericho to train Palestinian police officers, identifying part of the documents, um, which I, I was kind of a junior officer to be doing some of those type of things, but I spoke Arabic better than most of the people at the consulate. So I had opportunities to do public outreach, opportunities to, to meet with officials that um, some of my supervisors really opened up for me because they said, hey, Dan knows the language. Dan can talk to these people, he can connect with them. So there's a plug for, for really using that language skill. The State Department does value languages. Uh, it's, it's, it was harder to develop languages as, as an employee there than I thought because so much of the work is with English or you're, you're working with Washington, you're working with people who speak English or you're in meetings where you know, maybe a number of people speak English. Uh, so I didn't use my language as much as I thought in Kiev. It was an asset there where I got to do some negotiation with government officials and things as well. But um, it opens doors, but if you're going in to learn languages, it's a great way to do it. You can get paid for a year to study Arabic or Chinese or anything from Washington. Um, definitely a huge, perfect job. But um, I think there are better ways to purely learn languages. I don't know anywhere else where you can get paid to do it like the way you do there. So uh, let's see, after Jerusalem, I came back to get an MBA. I loved my job with the Foreign Service. It's a great experience. Um, one of the big, I guess a couple factors kind of led me away from that. Number one was graduate school. I wanted a graduate degree. And I noticed that people who excelled in the State Department, a lot of them, were people who were more than just linguists or policy experts. They were people who could manage people and information and resources. And that attracted me to an MBA or an MBA. I settled on an MBA because I thought, you know, I could spend my whole career in government, and that would be very valuable. But I wanted to see something a little bit different. I wasn't sure, if, and I'm still not sure, if I'll like business. But I would give it a try for a few years. I feel like it'll be much easier to move back into the world of government from business than to move from years and years of government um, into business. And that may or may not be the case, but that, that was my impression, it still is. So I wanted a um, graduate degree, I wanted a different experience outside of the government, and for family reasons, you know. Some people's families love it, the Foreign Service. I hear people rave about, I want to go in the Foreign Service because my kids have been educated at top-notch schools all around the world, they'll have fantastic experiences, et cetera, et cetera. That can be the case if you're in Singapore, if you're in London. Places like Kiev, however, that may not be the case. They were desperate for English-speaking teachers there. Not teachers with college degrees, not teachers with any credentials, but oh, you can speak English, you're American, we want you to teach our high school kids. If you have a kid who's trying to get take AP exams, who's trying to get into a, a, call, a reputable college in the US, that's going to impact their education. Um, I, I worked with a health officer um, in Kiev who worked for two decades in pediatrics in the US said she saw far higher rates of, of, of childhood problems, problems for children overseas than she did in the US, whether it was social adjustment or learning disabilities or, or other family problems that arose from living overseas, from moving the kids around every two to four years. They don't have roots. There's some great advantages to that. I had friends who loved it. I, I was a, a young man, a young, a young men's advisor, or a young men's advisor. I was a young men's advisor in the branch. Some kids loved it. They'd go, uh, they were on the local basketball team, the high school basketball team. They didn't go for competitions, not competitions, just, just their games, to Romania, to Bucharest, to, to Moscow. They, they'd go all over the region, and they had neat, neat experiences. But some kids didn't do well. So that's something that I feel compelled to, to say, uh, that I urge you to consider, is that um, it does have an impact on family. If people say it doesn't, and I think they're, they're, they're missing the boat, or they're ignoring reality, or maybe they're very, 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 very lucky in some ways. But, uh, Let's see, beyond that, um, is there anything else you want to know, or should we jump into questions? Or? Well, just going off of what you are just talking about, say you, I mean, you're studying, a lot of us are studying MESA, so we're learning Arabic, and we're learning about the Middle East, but for whatever reason, our circumstances, like we decide that we can't travel, or shouldn't travel for whatever reason, like what are good options to be able to use your major effectively, but not be going all over the place? The way, uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to do um, work using your major to major, meaning like using Arabic and focus on the Middle East, I think Washington is a great place for that. 
West Coast, there's a lot less just because geographically people are going to be sending employees to the Middle East. East Coast is where it's at. Uh, I know New York and Washington, especially Washington, I think is the best place for it. You may be able to find some other niches here and there. I have a father-in-law who works for Boeing in Seattle. He's done some travel work in Saudi Arabia and places like that. So you can definitely find other options. Or maybe, for example, in Houston, you can go to Texas, you can go to company. But if you want to use Arabic and Middle Eastern studies, I would say that Washington is the place to be. If you're open to other areas, like public administration working for a, a local city, working for a company, what I've done that I found works well with other organizations is focus on the transferable skills I developed as a basic major. I've been surprised, even, even as, as, as an MBA program at BYU, where I'm with individuals who majored in business as undergrads, I don't feel at all in any way that I'm at a disadvantage because the, the, the multidisciplinary approach to the Mesa major, and I felt like the, the academic rigor, at least in the classes I took, I felt that it was sufficient to help me learn to ask questions, to dig deeper into issues. I think the most important thing is to, like with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict class, that was a, one of the most valuable classes I think I took, not only to learn history and the nature of the conflict, to be able to take two opposing ideas, two um, concepts in opposition, or different points of view, and to hold them in, in your mind at the same time. And say, I can see value in, in this point of view, I can see value in this point of view. I have my own opinion, but to be able to understand another point of view, I think, is incredibly valuable. And it's surprising to me how difficult it is for so many people to do that. In the business school, I, I feel like those critical thinking skills, the writing skills, learning to write short memos rather than 30-page papers, those are some of the things that really benefited me. And if I, when I met with companies, that's what I focused on. Not necessarily that, oh, I've done this kind of financial analysis that you're interested in. I said, here are experiences I've had. And here are the traits that I've developed as a leader, as a thinker, as a communicator. And that's what most companies want. Um, the key there, for me, is also uh, learning about where you want to work. For example, I thought companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron would be interested in somebody with Middle Eastern experience. I met with some recruiters, and I was surprised that they looked over my resume, we chatted, things were going very well, I thought they were very interested in me. And then they said, what, um, what macros have you used in Excel? This was about my second or third week of business school. I said, I, I haven't used any macros in Excel. They said, well, tell me about your experience conducting optimizations. I said, I've never done an optimization. I know they have a class in optimization at the, uh, at the, in, in the business program, so I'll, uh, you know, I'll get a chance to do that. They said, I'm sorry, you can cut your teeth with somebody else, but we're not interested in hiring you here. That was it. There are some companies that say, you know, if you don't have these particular specific skill sets with Excel, then we're not going to bring you on board. The company I'm interning with this summer is a chemical company. My experience with them was vastly different. My major is supply chain in the MBA program. And they had a recruiting session for finance and marketing students. And I was interested in this company because they were primarily uh, focused on Europe and North America. In the past decade, they've expanded operations to China. And there's been some talk of them moving into North Africa, Middle East, and Eastern Europe, and expanding in South America as well. So I thought, oh, that, that'd be great. That's just the kind of company I'd like to work for. And um, I went and talked to them and said, listen, here's my experience. Here's what I can bring to the table. Uh, I don't meet your criteria of being a finance major, marketing major. How flexible are you that? And he said, we don't care what your major is. We don't care if you haven't done this particular specific thing. We care about your potential. We want people to be you know, potential leaders of our company. And we think you'll learn as much or more in our company as you will in the MBA program. So we want to bring you up to the potential. So I was surprised how much um, job opportunities weren't based on a specific industry. Like, oh, in this industry, they'll value my experience. But how much it depends on a specific organization. That Will they be willing to look at your background and say, huh, this is atypical? Because if almost anything you go to that's outside the government, the Mesa major is going to be atypical. Um, and they're going to say, um, this is atypical, I'm not interested. Or they'll say, this is unusual. Hmm, what does he have that we could use? And, and one benefit, huge benefit I've seen from the Mesa major as well, is that it does attract attention. Everywhere I go, and I tell people I've made her, you know, I've gone to some, some different recruiting conferences in Minneapolis, in San Diego, all over, you stand out. I majored in Middle Eastern Studies in Arabic. I spent the last four years as an American diplomat in Ukraine and Jerusalem, working with foreign government officials, businessmen, consultants, um, you name it. And they say, really? Huh, that may not be what I'm looking for, but that sounds interesting, and you can get them talking. And some of the interviews that I had were where I found commonalities. 
oh yeah, I, I served in Iraq for a year. Oh, I did some government contracting. Tell me about your experience with that. So that, um, that's probably a much longer answer. I'm not sure I have an answer what, what you're looking for. But, but focus on transferable skills. Um, if you've done something like management, you know, I wish I had taken more classes in undergrad in things like statistics and human resource management. But it, I, I, I took me five years or so to graduate anyway, so I, I wasn't going to do that. Um, that's part of what drew me back, as I, as I sort of said, uh, to, to an MBA. Was learning a little bit more about, about management, managing people, budgets, and things like that. I think that's incredibly valuable, whether you're going to work for government, business, nonprofit, in any field. Um, once you get to management level, that, that's what you need to succeed. And, and yes. Just so you know, they're all taking uh, political science 200 now, uh -huh. which introduces statistics to them. I never had I never for a lot of the that students, we'll, we'll push them to take it. Basic That's good. That so would really good. That would help you a lot. If you can familiarize yourself with Excel too, I've learned things as an MBA student that I think, oh, if I didn't know how to do this when I was in PF, I could have been and in Jerusalem, I could have done so much more with my job. Yeah, I was wondering because I have to take a few like statistics classes for like econ uh -huh. courses. Oh. Just like how will that be like actually <laughs> like useful, applicable? I just took a statistics class with uh, what was his name? I'll see if I can recall his name the professor who teaches statistics. And it was intriguing because he said he loved teaching the MBA statistics course because it was all about application and practice and not about theory. So um, if you ask... Depending on the course. Yeah, so it depends, it depends on the course. But, but what I feel like for me, what I was interested in, I don't understand a lot of theory, which is a disadvantage of me. For, for me, if I've done some analysis and I can't explain how I got to that, but I do understand how to get a result. What, what we did in this class was we take a statistics program and essentially plug information and learn how to manipulate the data to, to find out what is statistically significant. Then we'd also look at what's managerially significant. So maybe you know there's a 15% um, uh, you know, uh, significance to something that's not going to be statistically significant. But if you're a manager and you're saying, you know, there's an 85% chance that this makes a difference. I don't care whether statistically or sound or not. That's that's a good basis for me to make a decision on. So that, that was his comment to us, and it kind of rang home with me. He said, you study statistics, keep, keep one foot in reality. How can I use this to influence decisions, not just to you know, do like analysis? I don't know if that's your question. I don't know if statistics classes you know, which, which are good or bad, but for me, that's what I was interested in. Yeah. I think the basic statistics classes are oriented to a number of different applications. So if you just check into that before you sign up for one. Okay. Is it 221, is that right? Yeah, well, right now I'm just for my Econ 378, which is... Oh, well, you're way behind beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> way beyond. You're off line. Yeah. With the Foreign Service, how much say do you have and where you go? Um, initially, and from what I've heard, you have less and less. Um, that being said, however, um, I don't know, when I, when I signed on, they gave you a list of between 50 and 100 countries or assignments, and you would rank your top 20, and everybody I know got in one of their top 10. 99% of people got one of their top 4 or 5. Um, as you move through your career, in some ways you have more influence because you lobby for positions. Um, initially, it's largely determined by their need and your language abilities. I didn't realize that when I came on. For example, when they hired me, you, you get extra points if you can pass a language test, right? You can only pick one language. I spoke Russian a lot better on the phone than I did Arabic, so I took the test in Russian. I didn't know that there was a requirement, and there still is today in the Foreign Service. If you get extra points, for a language test, one of your first two assignments has to be in that language. So I came in really wanting to go to the Middle East for my first assignment. And they have what's called a career development officer, who essentially, with a panel, makes your first assignment. They represent your interests. And I told her, I really want to go to the Middle East. I speak Arabic. I want to use my Arabic and start a career in public diplomacy there. That's what policy suggests would be sound for the government as well. That's in, in the interest of the department. But they had this requirement. I had to do a tour speaking Russian because I'd taken that test. They said,
said, you're going to Ukraine. I had a great experience in Ukraine. I loved, I loved it. I'm glad I went there. But I wish I'd known, I, didn't, I, I had known that in advance. Um, so I put, just to give an example, my first bid list, I think some of my first, my top picks were, Kuwait was the only Arabic-speaking post on the list. It was Kuwait, except Iraq. I didn't want to go to Iraq because I had, uh, my wife's pregnant, so I was like, that's not. And I wouldn't want to go to Iraq now because I have three, three little kids. If I was single, maybe I'd thought about it. But, uh, uh, it was Iraq and Kuwait, so I put Kuwait down. I didn't put Iraq down, so I wasn't in the running for Iraq at all at that point. Um, I put Ukraine down, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, I put a couple of assignments in Mexico and China. Um, while you don't have a lot of control over it, they kind of make logical decisions that look like back on it. You know, that, you know, they had these certain rules they had to operate under. And I, I miss that sometimes, actually. I, I hear from friends that say, oh, I'm going to Oman, or oh, I'm going to Oman. Or, oh, I'm going to be in Thailand for the next two years. Or, I'm doing a year of Thai training in Washington. I think, wow, that's that's neat. There's there's definitely a new lifestyle in the Foreign Service. Uh, but sometimes people get assignments that they don't want to take. I know um, one couple that um, it's a tandem couple, meaning the husband and wife both in the Foreign Service. He spoke Arabic, so they assigned him to uh, Tunisia or somewhere. She wanted to go there as well, but for one reason or another, they assigned her to, to Haiti. So uh, they said, well, listen. We'll both go to Haiti, we'll both go to Tunis, we'll both go anywhere in the same place. Um, but we wouldn't be together. And they said no. So um, she left the service and they went to Tunis. So she put her job um, so they could be together. And that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes that kind of thing happens. So, Which, you know, if you've spent three months of training and they expect you to pay back tens of thousands of dollars in costs that they've incurred to move you to Washington and to put you up in housing and train you and whatnot, then that's a, that's a tough decision to make. But, you, 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 you have enough influence that I would go back to a foreign service for an instant, in, in an instant, feel comfortable that, you know, it might be hard for my family. Like if they'd sent me to Kyrgyzstan, where my wife was pregnant, instead of, or Uzbekistan, instead of Kiev, that would have been much, much more difficult. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the program. Okay, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, how is it uh, with the pay, like being able to raise a family and still be working overseas? I'm, I'm hoping at this point, and not only to graduate with no debt, but with enough savings to have a down payment on the house when I'm done. Because I had no house payment when I was posted overseas. If you have language ability, you can get a bonus anywhere from four to $25,000 a year for your language skills. So my base pay when I started was like, I think, right around 40 grand. I might have 42, I might have 38, which, you know, when we were in DC, I was like, oh, we had five kids. I don't know how I could survive on this. Of course, we didn't have five kids. When I went overseas in Kiev, all of a sudden I had no housing payments. Um, all of a sudden I got a 20% pay bonus for uh, for hardship differential there. I also got a cost of living allowance there. Then when I got another 12 or 15,000 a year for language pay, um, I was making pretty good money. I, I actually expect to graduate from my MBA making about the same as I did uh, in the Foreign Service because. Uh, Part of it's luck, like I have a friend who was assigned to, uh, I think it was Panama. They have zero differential there. So his salary, he went overseas, and if you're in Washington, you get a 20% bonus for cost of living. If you go overseas, that's reduced to zero, unless there's a hardship differential. Or, you know, they have poor medical conditions, or poor schools, or you can't get items on the open market, or, you know, your kids are going to get malaria or whatever. So uh, uh, he struggles financially to try and make, because he still had a house he's here, with the payments, and you know, the story. So uh, a little bit of it's luck, but especially if you're willing to serve in a post, speaking Arabic with some hardship pay, um, you can do very well financially. I was shocked how easy it was to save money, and it was um, very lucrative. As an undergrad, I don't think I, 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 I don't think I could have gotten a better job. But for, for the nature of the job as well. Um. I was wondering, I've looked at the website and a little information about the different uh, departments that you can choose to go into mm -hmm. in the Foreign Service, but I don't completely understand the differences between what you'd be doing or what what exactly one entails versus the other, and so I was, I was wondering about that, especially the the econ one, the consult one, and the, uh, the uh, diplomacy mm -hmm. one. So. Yeah, the, uh First two assignments are directed. I mean, they not only tell you where to go geographically, excuse me, they tell you what function you'll be working in. So even though I came on as a, con uh, sorry, a public diplomacy con officer, 
I never did a tour of public diplomacy. My first tour was in management, my second tour was in consular. Um, so public diplomacy, they have, I'll just kind of run through it quickly and give you my perspective on it. I guess first I'll talk about hierarchy a little bit. Um, when you sign up for the Foreign Service, there can be some strategy to getting in. Uh, the political cone is the hardest one to get into. You have to get the highest score to get into there. Management and consular cones have a lower a score that's required, a lower bar to pass to get in. And econ and public diplomacy fall somewhere in between. So some people use that to influence their decisions somewhat. Um, also, I think it's important to put out, in addition to your first two assignments being directed, your future assignments are assignments you've been on. That means even if you're an econ officer, you can do multiple tours in consular work if you want. Or if you're a management officer, you can do public diplomacy work. For example, the head of the political section in Jerusalem was a consular officer who worked at multiple embassies doing political work, because that's what she loved. It can make it harder to get those jobs because you have to kind of explain it and justify why it makes sense for you and your career in the department to send you there. It also can affect your promotions where they have in-cone promotions and out-of-cone promotions. So if I'm a, uh, a political officer doing political work, I get two chances to get promoted when they look at people in-cone and people out-of-cone. If I'm a consular officer doing political work, I only have one review uh, to get promoted. Um, I, I wouldn't let that drive my decision. I go where I want to go. Um, so political work, um, you'll hear different opinions. Uh, I know one guy who loved it. He got to meet with tons of government officials. He got kind of the inside scoop on policy and what's going on. He would work with American officials when they traveled to the Middle East to set up their agendas, to attend different meetings with them, et cetera, et cetera, and felt like he really was an expert on what was going on for the particular political issues in his portfolio. I have another friend who hated it. He said he felt like a monkey going around, showing these congressmen around in different bazaars so they could buy, they could buy tourist gifts, that he would go to meetings, he would write up notes on the meeting, send it to Washington, and nothing ever came of it. Um, so I think it depends on uh, who your boss is. It depends on where you're at geographically. For example, one friend who had an incredible experience was in Bhutan and was able to have a huge impact on American policy there. Because who else is trying to influence American policy in Bhutan, right? But if you're in Jerusalem and you're trying to make a huge shift in American policy as a junior officer in the State Department, Good luck, yeah, good luck. Um, even if you're a senior in the middle of the State Department, good luck. Pretty much policy, Middle East, well, not all the Middle East, but a place like yours and inside of the White House. Um, that's, that's, that's my impression and experience, you know, some people disagree. So it, it depends on where you want to go, what you want to do. Um, I know some people loved it, some people hated it. I, one friend had a conversation with the Ambassador of Jordan, who's now the S guy. At, at one time, he was the Ambassador of Jordan. He said, um, you know, I always thought once I became an ambassador, then I could influence policy. He said, now that I'm an ambassador, I'm still taking marching orders from Washington. I still have a boss in Washington. So I didn't realize that um, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do what I, what I wanted to do to the extent that, that I hoped to. Uh, I think that's more the case in the Middle East than anywhere else in the world. Because of, maybe because of domestic US politics and other reasons. But the Middle East can be hard, hard to crack. That's political. Uh, econ is dealing with economic issues. Uh, some examples, I have a buddy who did econ and set up a conference with, with some of his colleagues in Bethlehem for a couple thousand foreign investors to come in uh, and learn about investment opportunities in the West Bank of Gaza in, in Palestine. Um, so he was working to try and change the economic conditions there, as well as monitor them. Uh, I met with some of his contacts once, it was very interesting. A guy out of Gaza who ran gas stations. Where did he get his gas? Through PVC pipes from Egypt, you know, in these tunnels you hear about all the time. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's how business gets done in Gaza. So uh, for, it was interesting to hear about some of those economic issues. Um, so that, that's the other side of, of reporting. Like, you can, you can talk to people who are in very interesting areas and learn very interesting, very interesting things. And uh, you can influence U.S. policy, but it can be a big challenge. Um, so it's more focused on reporting on economic developments, and more and more there's an emphasis in both political and economic work on trying to influence political and economic developments in the country. If you're in a place like Dubai, you might be 
we're looking a lot at financial markets. If you're in the Gulf, you'll be dealing a lot with oil and natural gas. So if you're interested in those kind of economic issues, econ is the place for you. Public diplomacy has two branches. Um, is this more, am I going into too much detail or is this stuff? I'm not at all interested in this. Okay. If, if, if any of you close your eyes and start yawning, then I'll try and I'll skip to the end. Public diplomacy has two branches, cultural work and press work. Press work is working with journalists. Uh, I, I've heard it described, as a public diplomacy officer who never did it full time, but I've heard it described as the funnest job in foreign service. Because you get all the contacts, you're going to meet the interesting people, and try to have an impact like political officers, except you also have a budget to give money for people and programs, and you don't have to write all the reporting cables. So you, uh, you have a little more flexibility. Um, so uh, the, the press work, you're working with journalists, both to try and place positive press about the United States, to try and respond to negative press about the United States. For example, I had a friend who every day at 5 p.m. did he get a lot of press reports, he'd be working till 7, because you know they, they had these urgent issues they needed to try and get out of the evening news or evening press, or they were to get this, this uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, press statement, uh, you know, some kind of statement out on, on the website or to contact some journalists. I got to do one interview with journalists, and I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. It was in Arabic, and they never got to interview it. Americans in Arabic. Um, so, so I really had a positive experience with that. I think press work would be interesting. Um, cult the cultural work is running cultural programs, meaning you could be bringing American dance groups or art groups or things like that to a foreign country to help educate people about that program. You also have funds to help bring foreigners to the United States to learn about the U.S. International Visitor Leadership Programs. For example, one as a consular officer, I saw a lot of that, especially in Jerusalem, because we're processing visas for these people. It was intriguing, because you'd have one day, uh, you know, kids going for, you know, some peace group coming to the U.S. to spend summer at a summer camp, you know, with Palestinians and, and Israeli kids together to try and develop relationships and friendships um, between, you know, two parties to that conflict. The next day, I'd be interviewing um, Palestinian uh, security officials who all had ineligibilities for terrorist activity because they had been longtime members of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and for that and other reasons, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be on for visas. So you'd have to get waivers to say, oh, these people are terrorists, but we want to fund their travel as the U.S. government to go to the United States, and we want to give them visas so they can enter the United States, and then they pick the border, and Department of Homeland Security, and you'd be like, oh, well, what's this? What does this mean exactly? So it was, it, was, it was interesting to see some of the administrative side of that. And I was shocked how much I was a consular officer about that. So, so, so public diplomacy board, you have, you have budgets where you can deal with locals. In Kiev, another example I thought that was interesting is they had programs there to try and, uh, try and uh, uh, deal with HIV AIDS, to bring people from different groups, nonprofits that were trying to combat AIDS, they bring them to the U.S., meet with different groups here, you know, whether it's trying to prevent people spreading age or trying to help hospitals learn how to, you know, uh, keep things sterile. Um, that's public folks work in that show, I think. Consular work, um, I think, would be summed up as, as passports, visas, American citizen services. Um, I had a fantastic, as I did all, all, all of the above, you know, from visiting Americans who were arrested in Israeli jails to, you know, issuing passports, dealing with passport fraud, and doing you know, run-of-the-mill visa, visa work. Um, I loved it. It was intriguing because it, it, I got to use my foreign language more than any other job. I was using my Arabic. It improved a lot. And I was speaking all day with Palestinians. And I learned so much about Palestinians because one day I might be interviewing a judge. The next day I might be interviewing a farmer. The next day I'm interviewing, a, you know, some guy who, oh, you know, I, I, I saw his name in the paper yesterday. He is, you know, a member of Hamas, or, you know, different things like that. But we get to meet people from all over. Anybody who wants to come to the U.S. has to come through the consulate. So, so that was interesting. Um, I also learned a lot about different groups there as the fraud manager, whether it was dealing with Palestinian security services or, um, you know, different violent organizations or political organizations. What's American policy towards these organizations? Which ones are deemed terrorist groups? Which ones aren't? What's the difference? Is there a difference? You know, what questions should I be asking in an interview? Who's using fake papers? Who's smuggling drugs and weapons? Why are they smuggling? In interesting questions. That are also working on the U.S. side with the FBI, with Secret Service. Um, it was a fun job. I loved it. But part of it was luck. I had a great boss who said, "Dan, if you want to do big things with this job, you go out and do them." You know, he didn't stand in my way. I had other friends who 
you know, had ideas, and the boss would say, okay, I'll handle that, or, you know, I know I want you to focus on your interviews, and that's it. So a lot depends on your boss, a lot depends on where you're at. If I lived in a place like Korea, they're doing 200 interviews a day, I probably wouldn't have an experience like that. But Jerusalem's a good place for that. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering that how much do you have to be careful of like expressing your own personal opinion when you're talking to people? Like, if that question makes sense, like, as a representative of like the U.S. government. In, in general, not really. You know. Just just on the street, if I was talking with somebody, I'd speak pretty freely. Okay. I, I did feel like, you know, I was there, the government was paying for my housing and everything. Yeah. That I, I wanted to represent the United States, kind of like if you're a missionary for the, for the church or something. That In general, I didn't have a hard time doing that because I felt like there's so much uh, misinformation that uh, it's easy to try and inform people. There was a big difference between Ukraine and Jerusalem now. I did some speaking experiences in Ukraine that were all positive. Um, in Jerusalem I had some very, very different experiences. One example was, um, was uh, I just read an article. I had just read an article, something about uh, the history of waterboarding. How you know it had been used as a torture technique by the Chinese or something, or suspected they were using it in the 1950s or something. The U.S. administration came out and said, you know, this is clearly a form of torture. We oppose it, and they kind of, you know, berated the Chinese for their suspected use or something along those lines. But the general gist of it was that the history of waterboarding suggested that it had been used as torture in the past. The United States had condemned it for such. So then I'm speaking before this group of Palestinian college students, and people start. Uh, lambasting Guantanamo, and um, especially in a country where these people, some of them had been arrested by Israelis or had been abused by Israelis, you know, in terms of there have been Israeli Supreme Court cases dealing with torture that show that that you know um, it, it can be permissible in certain situations, or it was permissible, or it wasn't strictly forbidden in the past, but now it is. So there's been some controversy about that in Israel. And so I know that some of these people are, are speaking, you know, from, you know, close experience with relatives and whatnot, to stand up there and, and talk about Guantanamo and say that that's, um, that's something that the U.S. has to do, that, you know, we're committed to human rights around the world, but, um, but um, you know, we've also got to protect our national security, and we're, we're trying to negotiate the best way to do that, which we're going to do. You know, obviously that's not the policy of the State Department, and I, I didn't say anything about that at the time. I did my job, but I, it was a wake-up call to me after serving in Ukraine. I think I spoke when I, if, uh, I spoke to a group of Jerusalem students. I know if you're in that group. Some, someone asked a question like that. I said, you know, it wasn't really that hard for me because my experience in Kiev was I, I didn't have to deal with that. The Middle East, I think, it could be much, much more difficult. I had a couple experiences like that. It was kind of wake-up call. It's like, wow, you know, do I feel like I'm being true to myself? And, do I want to have this job, you know, to be a full-time public diplomacy officer, trying to talk to people and do those policies? In general, I agree with a lot of those policies, and we do a lot good overseas. I'm a strong supporter, right? But uh, there, are, there are a few things here and there around Guantanamo that, that, that I don't want to try and sell overseas or in the U.S., and that, that's a tough thing. Well, well, let me jump real quick on management work. That's what I did in, in Kia, doing contracting stuff. Great experience to learn about management. Very frustrating time because of government management, but also very positive. I don't know what time we, how much time we've got here. You guys are probably about bored to death. But uh, if you want to chat for a couple more minutes, free. If you need to leave or have classes or just more excuse to head out, feel free. But I'm glad to take more questions about business or foreign service or Mason Major or anything else. Well, shifting shifting to the business portion, you're going to study supply chain management. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friend that does supply chain management for IBM. And I chat with her about what she does and kind of what entails this and that and integrating business software into other businesses and, and yada yada. Is that the kind of route that you're interested in as far as like Middle Eastern circles or is it more like a chamber of commerce? You want to be a buffer between, you know, two economies and they're trying to, you know, both progress but by trading, like what what kind of route? I, I, to be honest, I don't really know what I want to do. I haven't figured it out yet. I did have a strong feeling that I didn't want to do finance work mm -hmm. just because I wasn't really drawn to it. <laughs> um, I, I was most attracted, I thought, to marketing, HR, and, and supply chain. 
starts with HR because I don't know, I had a liberal arts degree and felt like, you know, some of the organizational behavior type of issues just seemed interesting, you know, leadership, training, that kind of thing. Strength of marketing and the prospects of, you know, trying to go into new markets, open up new markets, or, you know, dealing with different demographics, trying to tailor marketing approaches or different products to certain markets. Like I really said, that would be interesting about marketing. Um, supply chain I was kind of interested in because I did some um, process improvement work in Kia. It's called SM9000. It's one of a number of tools that people use to try and identify business processes to define, here's what we do, here's how we do it, and then to try and improve it, to try and uh, document it, define it, and then find ways to improve it. I thought that was pretty cool to find ways to do things more efficiently. Uh, supply chain also is very global nowadays, and that's, that's what attracted it to me as well. Uh, I felt like as much as any other area of business, perhaps more, I don't know, um, if you're in supply chain, you're not moving things from Wisconsin to Texas. You're moving things from China to the US, or from Saudi Arabia to Germany, you, you know, all over the world. So that global aspect of it really, really attracted me. Um, 